What's up, everybody? This is Illiterate. We are covering the second part of Batman today. My name is Evan. I just watched the new Batman film by Matt Reeves. My name is Taylor, and I dug into old Empire magazines from the early 90s. Here we go. We have just gotten through the release of Tim Burton's 1989 Batman, which revolutionizes basically major release media. This is the onset of major retail marketization, the rollouts of all of the toys. Uh, this is the, the onset of the opening weekend mattering more than the overall box office. Yeah. And immediately they go into trying to uh, do a sequel. Yeah. The question that I had starting this out, Evan had said before we started recording, it's like the gun is loaded. Now it's just going off <laughs> every, <laughs> you know, they're just trying so many different things. Because there Why? have been a yeah. lot, there have been a lot of films, but to recap, we only covered two of those films <laughs> in the first part and we will cover the rest of them in the second part and we'll get to exactly why the back half of this is so as i as i said off mic loaded <laughs> <laughs> all over the place because we ended with this guy michael uslin which i mispronounced but then i read his book also so <laughs> that's actually how you pronounce this thing. he said everybody gets he said everybody gets it wrong <laughs> he's at this meeting with the marvel people and then they said we like what's going on here he has some more meetings and ends up suggesting a marvel property that he thinks would work well in the form of luke cage hmm. the superhero luke cage that they have because they can't do fantastic for captain america again they tried you know the special effects disasters right it's just not going to work Luke Cage is one of the original black superheroes, simple powers, invulnerable skin, super strength, the sense of place. They could put it in New York in the late 70s. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The production companies that Michael is associated with folds and then Universal gets sold. So this never goes through. But a decade later, Marvel starts with a different black superhero, Blade, in right. 98. Right. Off they go. X-Men in 2000, Spider-Man in 2002. We're off on the races. <laughs> now, it's, it's wild yeah. to think that then this stuff just might, I mean, who knows what would have happened if Batman 89 failed. Right. Um, <laughs> good Lord. Mm -hmm. Right at this moment here, bridging into the 90s, if it had not gone the way it had gone, what would we be going to <laughs> see at the movies? Yeah. It's, it's a really interesting question. It is. And Marvel is picking up on the success. And eventually Luke Cage gets his due on Netflix. Yes. Recently. But yes. all of all the Marvel stuff then, just to have that in the background of like, right. they're struggling too and trying to work on their own things. They actually, they of course supersede DC with the Marvel Cinematic Universe and whatnot. But we'll get to that. Yeah. Something else that's in the background, which I wanted to clarify because we laughed about it in our previous episode. I went back and looked into Detective Comics. Yeah. What the heck happened to them? Yeah, because they felt like I kept sticking up for them. It felt like Batman just kind of came in, took all the spotlight, yeah. and it, they got used. And then so, 200 so episodes later, 200 issues yeah. later, they got used again <laughs> just for a little bump in the race. So, so what happened was they're still ongoing, and our assessment was completely wrong. So it really, you know, it, it became Detective Comics starring Batman. That was a, literally every single one. He's also the cover. He's also in. Thank he God. never went away. He just got his own thing too and a bunch of other stuff. So they started with Batman being the front cover and then like with manga, they have some other detective -y stories. Mm -hmm. And then when that got less popular, they were adding other Justice League or superhero stories. Uh, and then it was just Batman. Gotcha. And now they're on issue 1057 <laughs> and it's Batman Detective Comics, basically. Sick. Batman okay. is big and Detective is real small in the <laughs> front. There I was just thinking about this like weird <laughs> cops and robbers comic that just like started an amazing, like the most influential superhero maybe. And then it, they just left. <laughs> No, it's, yeah. he, he never left. He stayed. Good, it's just good, a different good. Batman. That makes me comics. feel much better. Yeah. Thanks for filling that hole. Correction, everyone. <laughs> so good for them. Where we're going to pick up is, like you're saying, this super success, and they want a sequel. Tim Burton notably does not want to do a sequel. He had mixed emotions about mm -hmm. the whole thing. And he has, he's, I mean, because it couldn't have been a bigger success for him. He's been trying to get so many things going throughout the 80s. Right. There's more going on in Tim Burton's mind than, oh, I want to follow up this really, really hard movie. This movie that <laughs> nobody knew was going to work, that everybody kind of just took a chance on me. And do I want to put my neck on the line again to see and risk it? 
or do I want to do other things? Mind you, a <laughs> nightmare before Christmas is being made in parallel with this. He didn't direct oh, wow. that, but he oversees it right. very, very closely. So there's just as one thing that's going on directly parallel with the production of Batman Returns. Right. And s- similarly, Burton is, is saying, well, I got to have somebody that can write something that I want to direct. He gets Mark Waters, who had written Heathers in 89. Oh, yeah. And ends up giving Burton a script that he's happy with. Some of the ideas that were added or dropped, Penguin for Mayor actually comes from the Adam West TV series. That was in a few episodes. Interesting. Okay. And then Robin was in and then got cut. And they actually had costume fittings. It was going to be played by a black teenage mechanic played by Marlon Wayans. Oh my gosh, I did not know this. <laughs> yeah. Really? In in yeah. returns. This is amazing. I would yeah. love I gotta see this. I gotta go see this concept art. Well, I don't know. You know, you, has it oh you haven't seen it. Okay. It was in the shooting script and he was at, at fittings and then they didn't shoot anything with I him. Bet. I got it. Now I'm gonna, sorry, guys. Sorry, I should have. <laughs> I wish I'd known about this. I would have went and found those photographs. They probably exist out there, but they might not. Maybe. Who knows? Yeah. But now I'm gonna go look. It's a lesser known piece, but yeah, That's people awesome. ask because Robin, no idea. Robin for the public was so connected to Batman because of the Adam West. Let's 66 remind stuff. E- let's yeah. remind the audience that Billy D. Williams uh, Lando is playing Dent in this iteration as well, and then that oh. is a a seed planted for what would happen to him. So that I don't know, it's just a very interesting. Uh, I would have loved to have seen Billy D. Williams actually become Two Face, which yeah. I don't know if you had this plan for later, but they do. They did release the third part as a comic book. It was oh, a follow up, a comic book version of Tim Burton's Batman, the third <laughs> movie as a comic book where Billy D. Williams becomes Two Face. Uh, I haven't read it, but I've seen it. It's out. I think pretty sure it's out. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Uh, everybody, go check that out. <laughs> Another link in the chain of this version versus all the other ones. It just came out like a year or two ago oh, it's, wow. it's incredibly fresh yeah so the, the other person that gets added of course is catwoman this was a big deal because sean young who was supposed to be vicky vale yes. had an accident on the first film and then got replaced there was a bunch of criticism because she was on the warner brothers lot in full catwoman demanding an audition and then was on the i had Joan a boss Rivers who show. witnessed that i oh, had really? a boss on, on on a show i worked on who witnessed sean young come to set vying for the role uh, yeah. dressed up uh it, <laughs> and it got a lot I, of, I, yeah got it a got of a guff. lot of it did it did get a lot of guff and I, I hate to think that that actually damaged her career but i don't know well i think because I looked a little bit more into the Joan Rivers thing where she does yeah. a little bit and then it's a you know 25 minute interview she's a normal person it was more maybe a bit ahead of its time she's trying to confront the barriers around actresses at the time I think if she did that in today's age nobody you know that, that would you would never you wouldn't even get the article written about you basically everybody's trying to grab for that cred so much yeah and, you know but, so like if you take that that her doing that to today I, you know I feel like yeah, <laughs> you know. Right, but the, at the time, the at media the time, was like, oh, sure. look at this mad, crazy woman, uh, which is horrible. We've been talking a that, lot yeah. about the media perception of women through mm-hmm. the 90s. This is it. Here this we are. This is part of it. Yeah, that's why I wanted to bring it up. And then also with perceptions, you had sent me a link to this last week, that the McDonald's Happy Meal was having toys related to this, and they had promos, and there was a ton of guff, because this is for some people, even darker. So this is the one thing about Batman Returns that probably on the outset general audience members don't really remember or or understand is there is a tone shift between 1989 Batman and 1991's Batman Returns. Batman Returns gets incredibly dark. Uh, yeah. it, it deals with like physical deformities and, you know, like orphan children and be, like, trafficked in politics. And, and it gets there's there's graphic murder at, at some points and, and it, it has BDSM qualities and about it. It, it, it is too. it is creepy. wildly yeah. creepy. It is as gothic and as dark as Batman 89 looks on the outset. We are talking about now these filmmakers are emboldened to go further with it. And in this case at the time when it came out it looked like it was not for children (laughs) at all (laughs) and so you have upset i was laughing at it because it's like a a news piece i sent to taylor but it's like upset like parents who are like my child is screaming crying because i 
won't take them to the movie advertised on the Happy Meal box because I can't take them to the movie on <laughs> yeah. the Happy Meal box. It was it was kind of funny, but yeah, uh, it, it was quite the quite an interesting tonal predicament presented to the public, and it's not the last time that basically that exact argument was presented. What do you mean? The- when the Dark Knight came, <laughs> came oh, out, right, right, right. yeah, yeah. So that was the thing. McDonald's had to double back. I had seen some things say that they pulled, but they didn't. They never pulled the toys, right? Because they were ambiguous enough that they just said, "Oh, we're just promoting Batman, not right. this specific film," right? Which is not true at all. But okay. they had to say <laughs> they had to say something. But yeah, this it's good that you bring up that it's like, oh, this is Tim Burton making a big budget art film. The versions that exist is Adam West and Burt Ward with shark <laughs> right. repellent and right. Michael Keaton. Joking Maybe a around. pencil yeah. through the eye all in camera is like a <laughs> bit much. So like that was the exact same argument yeah. that happened in 91 arose in 2008. So we'll constantly see this flip flop. But what it did do well is make money. So over double its budget, although it made 145 million less than the first one. Hmm. But of course, the first one was insane. Yeah. But WB sees this as, oh, this is the problem. We're not happy. We need more money. We should have made more money off of this. Now we can kind of see where the gears are turning of what they changed. Yeah. Because they refused to say that the like the chronology of it, like the canon of it had changed when the next film comes out. <laughs> and then again, when the next film came out. Yeah. So 95 <laughs> is Batman Forever. And this is a quote somebody said. I always hated those titles like Batman Forever. It sounds like a tattoo somebody would get or something a kid would write, (laughs) something a kid would write in their yearbook. And Tim Burton had said that. He is a producer on the next one, but he's not involved in it. They get Joel Schumacher to direct because they want something more mainstream and ultimately gets mixed reviews because the tone shifted again, (laughs) whiplashing people to now it's even more of this rock and roll comic book look, which it's not necessarily wrong to do that. Batman has seen worse or different, but it's just this kind of funny how Six Flags, basically this movie came out and they went, this is what our parks will look like. (laughs) Right. Right. (laughs) Neon uh, lights and the, yeah. I I have to commend the casting decision for putting uh, Tommy Lee Jones and Jim Carrey opposite each other in like cartoonish, like bank heist. Like the whole movie opens with them locked in a safe pulled out of a bank (laughs) tower by a helicopter and they're just like screaming like psychopaths the entire time and as just as a creative thanks (laughs) (laughs) so the the uh the executives were thanked as well by ticket sales financial success again new record for opening weekend and it got bumped up another hundred million from the last one they made so still better and like All this, we're saying, oh, the ups and downs, it's still making three times its budget. Right. It's not nothing. The big, they're one of the biggest movies of the year. Right. (laughs) Right. (laughs) But they're like, how can we get back to 89? Yeah. So, right, right, right. Chasing uh, that high. Just, yeah. What can we do? How can we? (laughs) Yeah. Mark Walters comes back in. He was the guy who Tim Burton got to write the darker. Mm-hmm. Penguin stuff. He had an idea for Catwoman that he's pitching in '95, the same time this comes out. Oh, really? Again, darker. It's Selena Kyle moving to this Vegas like place, fighting parodies of male superheroes. No one liked it because they're like, "What? That we just didn't want to do this. Like, who wants this right hmm. now at all?" So hmm. that's that's back in the back. But there's a Catwoman idea that got floated around in '95, right? They are fast tracking the next one, Batman and Robin, for June 97. They're not giving it the full three years, not even close to get this out in time. Kilmer's schedule conflicts. Clooney is in. Schumacher is wanting to slide back into more even like the TV show from the 60s. <laughs> right. So now you have like you have co-opted the visual style of Batman 89 and now you are trying to meld it back with the comedic tone of Adam West's show. Yeah. And it ends up 
resulting in this like really flashy kids toy commercial that honestly I was prime audience for it and I <laughs> loved it. I loved it, baby. When you're a it was, kid, yeah. Oh man, yeah. 1997. It was Lost World and Batman and Robin, baby. Give me Alicia Silverstone <laughs> as Batgirl. I was crazy for it. I loved it. Yeah, it's it, and this is where the negative. This is the 12 percent one. The negative reviews because. It was made for merch. It's campy. People were all up in arms about the, the dip- Taco the- Bell tie-in yeah. with all the different <laughs> cups of all the characters. I got. I had. I wanted Batgirl. She was my favorite. Yeah. My my, <laughs> my dad was like, "What was all the drama with the nipples and the cod piece and the?" Oh, I didn't that- see, and I didn't even notice as a kid. It's so funny right. to look at it now because it that stuff just totally flew by me. It has become yeah. such a focal point of like conversation. The and in the... si- uh-huh. And it's all there. It's very, very strange from the outset. But as a kid, it totally didn't <laughs> didn't even notice. Didn't I there's so much other stuff to so much other color to look at? Yeah. Well, so Joel Schumacher, people had said on set he would say before takes through a megaphone, remember everyone, this is a cartoon, which you could imagine creates a certain craziness <laughs> to the to the Meanwhile, set. all the comic book nerds like keel over in their <laughs> yeah. stomachs. <laughs> yeah. And also, I, I don't know if this means anything, but they wrapped two weeks ahead of schedule, which is a way hey, like, we that, did. <laughs> that either means things are going very well or things are very, very wrong. Like, yeah. Let's like, so put this in real terms. Either it's the things went like so incredibly well that it's just a raging success and, and everybody yeah. would be happy to turn around and, and come back and do it again or. You just or don't they see sped that through it. It doesn't happen. It does. It, these things do not happen. You never finish <laughs> early, and if you do, it's re. It's really concerning. Right. It is really concerning as somebody who is like in control of the money. It's really concerning when something like that happens because it almost never does, and it's never good when it does. Well, also, if something is which this one was one hundred and twenty-five million dollars to make, it's like how did we do think this through <laughs> so wrong? That we just have 14 days that we don't have to do. Like, we you guys want to like, I don't know, <laughs> kick around another storyline? We can probably fit yeah. it in the runtime, you know? So I that, don't know. You guys <laughs> up for it? <laughs> well, so to that, it's like, why did Schumacher do this then? <laughs> he said a lot of it had to do with the fast tracking, the pressure. It's kind of being in the eye of the storm where it was like more, better, faster, louder, more like what it was before. He had said he wanted to go back to something like The Dark Knight, but the studio was definitely not in that place. So he just dove head first into what everybody is looking at with all but this money involved. I want to put out my the ant the the kind of the the contour to what I just said. Something that yeah. made me infuriated me as a prime audience member, target audience member of this. If this whole thing is set up to sell me toys, that's fine. I'm a kid. I love <laughs> toys. I want, I want. I yeah. want toys from the movie. As a fan of the movie, it was almost impossible to go to the store and find a toy that actually represented the things you saw in the film. Right. They almost always were like hyper stylized or like gave them some be- action launch bazooka, you <laughs> yeah, know, like yeah, yeah. just rig- rig- they gave them some uh, wild vehicles. They just are like having a blast in some board <laughs> meeting somewhere i guess but as a ch- i'm seven years old or five years old i am not dumb i want i saw this in the movie why can't i go and go to the store and find that why are you selling me a bazooka and, <laughs> and a plane that i didn't ask for that is something that oh, consistently yeah. bothered me as a kid and as, if this stuff is all working in a concerted direction for this is the takeaway why couldn't they have at least sold me the things from the movie that I wanted. They sold me all this other stuff I didn't want. I mean, I didn't I didn't want it. I didn't buy right, it. Right. And I, and I always, always, always looked at like a freak from other kids who were like shooting their bazookas at each other. And I'm like, you guys are a dumb. Sheep. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so with, with that, combining it with Batman Returns, which was darker, kind of in a way like this new one is also not indicative of having a bunch of merchandise. The one that this just came out with Robert Pattinson. Yeah. bizarre. So... I came home from the film saying it was interesting. They kind of avoided doing a couple classic things. You would think of, I I described to my wife how like, oh, Batman like flies, you know, with his wings, but it's unlike what we've seen before. Usually it's picturesque and it's perfect and the wings are amazing. And it's some like incredible, you know, Apple product that just (laughs) works. 
Well, in the new film, it is legitimately one of like the flying squirrel suits that takes a second to zip up and put on. It's like much more real world and it's a little clunky. Yeah. I come home. And I'm like talking about, oh, it's kind of interesting to see it. You know, people used to think of the Christopher Nolan movies as being real world and grounded. And this makes that stuff look like an absolute cartoon in a way. Yeah. And I woke up this morning and I saw a Facebook ad advertising toys for the new movie where he's got snap wings <laughs> and he's flying through the city and he's like phrases that he spouts that like he never says and i just like i i audibly like guffawed and <laughs> sent it to my wife it was like they can't help themselves yeah <laughs> yeah and like with it's like the happy meal stuff it's like you really probably shouldn't take your nine-year-old to see the newest one right you know, with right. that, with that grounded. So, you know, yeah, same mistake. I, no, no, new, I look new at decade, it now. Yeah. I'm like, okay, the new one, if uh, the tonally, I was like, it's probably the more, the more adult one. It's not like crazy, crazy, crazy adult, but it is definitely more adult yeah. than, than most of these. So it's like, and, if you can introduce the dark Knight to a kid when they're, you know, 10, maybe <laughs> wait till 13 for the Batman. <laughs> right. So on the opposite end, Batman and Robin from 97, the least grounded realistic <laughs> in the universe it tanks them and Clooney in interviews where they're like do you ever apologize for that and he's like I only and always <laughs> apologize <I> only <laughs> for doing that so but what's I'll interesting thank him. Yeah. if I meet him I'll, I'll thank you you don't apologize <laughs> I had a blast with it thank you so much <laughs> You know, it did fine financially by my standards. Like it, it made double the budget, but right. it cost four times as much as the first one. So it like, oh, so it was really... it bad or was the business bad? <laughs> it sounds like your business was bad. <laughs> yeah. So alongside that, what's so fascinating is the animated world, right? Which we didn't get to at all because it's Super Friends and whatever I... in the '60s and '70s flourishes with interpretations of Batman. These things are on a decline through 95, 97, and then there's a dry spout at this exact same moment. You have the renaissance of the Batman animated. Yeah, uh, so this is uh, 92 to 95. Some call it the best adaptation of Batman, or mm -hmm. even it's in the lists of best animated shows. It won wow, four yeah. Emmys. This mixes Burton's timeless noir setting with airships and you know this neo-gothic mm, mm. architecture with the old fleischer 1940 superman cartoon yes, yes vibes that art deco mm -hmm. the gothic you know but the depth of the characters and it's it's very adult without overtly showing mm -hmm. you know shooting somebody or anything like that like the old you comics. know it's ink yeah. and line so mm -hmm. it's not it's you know it is an anime you know so it, yeah. it can be dark and gritty but it, at the end of the day it has a, a blur over it because it is drawn mm -hmm. and it gives it a a, a bit of distance that's why sometimes like gritty awful animes work because there's there's, <laughs> there's some there's some separation yeah. there <laughs> some uh suspension of disbelief to where you yes, insert yeah exactly so one exactly. of the drawing things that was interesting with this is they drew on black paper with light colors for the background Whoa. so it, it was the opposite of what you would do because oh, so of how the mood needed to be and and the almost expressionist quality of it so i've never heard that before yeah. i love that the notable pieces, of course, Mark Hamill as the Joker. Yes. Blew up. And then we had mentioned in our Justice League episode, but or maybe our Joker episode, the creation of Harley Quinn comes from this yes, show. Yes, yes. And now she's the one of the tentpole figures of DC. The character of Bruce Wayne, because we had talked about how all these things change all the time, he really is not as much playing his dumb, self-absorbed playboy persona in this show. He's more assertive intelligent involved in wayne enterprises <laughs> an executive <laughs> yeah it's <laughs> less yeah. it's less oh i'm a con, this is a con right and i don't want to be doing this he's yeah. like actively trying to run wayne enterprises instead of just like the man in the shadow in the background <laughs> that everybody's like is he in today not today yeah or he's dumb and doesn't know anything and just with random models right. that's that's right. not so much this they, no, I definitely, yeah. I definitely appreciate this active Bruce Wayne being. Mm -hmm. it, it gives him way better a cover of being like, <laughs> no, I can't be out there fighting crime. I'm running a multi-billion-dollar. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's they. They also adapt, and there's lists online, but tons of the comic stories. They're very faithful to the source material as far as mm -hmm. plot lines and arcs and whatnot. And this went on to influence the Arkham video games that started in 2009. 
Right. And they got a lot of the voice cast too. So Mark Hamill and Kevin Conroy, many of the others reprise their roles in the video games. That's really cool. Because that's, of this. that's so, special. So that that's the influence from this show. It had its own film that went to theaters. The only animated theatrical release. What was it called? The Ma- Phantasm? Yeah, or Mas- <laughs> yeah Ma- Mask of the Phantasm. It's yes. Set, it's set in the show continuity and came out in 93. We had talked about Frank Miller's year one after he did The Dark Knight Returns. Right. And that brought him back to basics. There was a arc called year two that came after adding on to what he had done. And that's what this movie is loosely based on. Mm. They add in this love story, which really puts him into turmoil. He's choosing this life, this Batman life, after his fiance leaves unexpectedly. And so mm. it really puts a lot to the, like you're saying, the Bruce Wayne character in the animated stuff mm-hmm. gets a lot more. It's his due. The notable connection between this and what has just come out with the Batman, Robert Pattinson, I'll post a link to where he talks about this in a in an interview, but he cites this version of Bruce Wayne as what he was hoping to emulate in the Batman, really capturing the psyche of this is his choice. And he it's not he doesn't become someone else when he's the Batman. He's he's feeling everything right in the moment as well. It's not a a veil to hide behind. Right. So I, I just had never heard that this specific film, but for Robert Pattinson, he was like, no, I, I hoped my, my performance would have been as good as this one. Gotcha. Which is wild. It, it, it's interesting the way that the Waynes are recontextualized in this narrative that I really appreciated. And it put a different impetus on Bruce. Um, How so? Because the, typically the, the character is always this, it's been tragic philanthropy. Oh no, the Wayne, the Wayne's murdered. What will the city do without all their money? The, all of the sun is, oh, if only your parents were here to <laughs> save everyone. Uh, it's been that for so long. This movie does, I think what is the smartest thing about it is it recalibrates the politics and it puts the Waynes directly in the center of it. it. It posits that Bruce's father was running for mayor when he was assassinated. Mm-hmm. And I think that that directly charges the narrative, whereas it's always been this indirect arms length, like tragedy. Now it's really worth talking about Bobby Kennedy getting shot before the election. You know, that right. that type of uh, that type of backstory here that I, that I think really worked for it. And it puts this diff, a, a different light onto Bruce um, and the squirreliness of politics and corruption and who's absolutely. behind the city. and Because yeah. we get into all that stuff and all these other things. But again, it's it's all so indirect. It's, and even at the like the end of Dark Knight is like the Joker, like abstractly talking to Gotham <laughs> as, and their soul without say, without really honing in on like, oh, no, the people make up the government, which makes the decisions mm. and decisions have consequences on the people they govern it. Right, it, right. It, it really recalibrates it and centers the narrative and puts the morals really where they need to be. I, I really respected it as a, a mystery. Mm-hmm. And for the first time feeling like I was really seeing Batman and Gordon solve a crime, like they are actively like trying to solve seven, you know, yeah, the David yeah. Fincher, you know, it, that is what we is the thrust of the narrative really focuses on. And it does a good job of using all of these characters that we know without wasting them yeah it doesn't introduce anything that's not directly related to where we will end up at the end of the film well and what's so cool about putting all that together is like we had talked about in our last episode the year one revitalization really recentered the gordon dynamic which we had also said was in the first time right. he was in detective comics Right. And then as well as the Wayne family stuff has been in the comics. The Court of Owls is this whole subplot within the comics of this secret society really controlling Gotham and was the Wayne right. family involved. And, you know, it's not coming out of nowhere. It's not like, wow, I can't believe Matt Reeves came up. <laughs> it's like no, these pieces yeah. have all been in here as well. They've it's been there, but finally... now we're actually putting them, we're putting the right focus on them. And it's actually, and again, going back to the way, you know, we were talking about the the animated uh, version of him through the 90s and being in you know, a different light, being more active. Whereas like in the um, Nolan films, he's a bit more like taking a back seat and elusive. I thought that 
the recalibration of the politics, overtly the politics in this film, gave Bruce Wayne credence to hide. Whereas right. before, I felt you felt like he had. I always felt like he had more impetus to stand up and do more because of the tragic <laughs> loss of his parents. Now in yeah. this one, you had. I saw what was much more like, oh man, my father was going to be president. I could never be president. Yeah, and he is gone. The movie also does a good job of of attacking Bruce's perception of his family. I won't break open the spoilers there, but that was the thing that I thought to yeah. be actually worthwhile because of the recalibration of the in through politics. You attack how Bruce sees his family. Maybe he doesn't know everything. That's really interesting. Yeah. Something that has not been, like you said, it's it, that side of things, except for the animated stuff is at an arm's distance for all of these other pieces. I will throw out one final animated thing talking about different versions of Bruce. So Batman Beyond was by the same team that did the animated series. Are you familiar with this at all? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. 99 to 01, very cool, Blade Runnery, future cyberpunk. And yes. Bruce Wayne is in his 70s and he's mentoring this new version, which is interesting too, because it almost has a bit of a Spider-Man angle because he's, he's in yeah. high school. So it's got these high school issues and drugs and relationships and all of the stuff. It won two Emmys as well. Wow. Very cool. That. And that'll come back to haunt us later as we talk about <laughs> what's what's going on. Because like we had said, Batman and Robin has failed us or failed the studio at least. Right. Now we come to the glut of canceled, unhinged ideas leading up yeah. to the reboot <laughs> stuff. Well, let's let's go through a couple of like the failed ideas. What were the, because remind me, they go from 1997 is the release of Batman and Robin, and there's not another- To 2005. Uh, there's not another live action entry until 2005. Yeah. So that's not for <laughs> lack of trying. <laughs> Here's all, I mean, it's, it's not going to be a few. It's going to be a lot. Here's all <laughs> of the trying. So during the dailies, in the, of the 97 Batman and Robin. They're like, this oh. looks good. This looks good. We're finishing two weeks ahead. So they hire Schumacher for a third film of that he's going to do, you know, because he's done two now. So <laughs> wow, two weeks ahead is great. It's just roll right up. <laughs> it's, uh, it's called Batman Unchained. And he's saying, well, I got to. <laughs> he's sorry. He's just saying. I can't do this. It's like, I got to do a darker toned thing. Like what I want, like this is too much. So he hires the writer of who had recently written a draft in 97, mind you, of eventually what becomes 2007's I Am Legend. Oh gosh. This, all, okay. this, this writer. Um, and they have Scarecrow as the main villain, which of mm. course comes about mm -hmm. in, the, in the remake. Joker is a hallucination. Harley Quinn they bring in from the animated show. They're trying to avenge the Joker's death and all the villains come back in the end and it ties Whoa, it all up. Yeah. The draft is basically done, but then Batman and Robin comes out, doesn't outgross any of the other films. And there was this $150 million Superman film that just got canceled as well. Right. The Nick Cage one. Right. I believe so. If that was the late nineties. There's a, yeah. yes, yes. There's a, uh, there's some great YouTube uh, video documentaries about uh, a similar failed project that we're talking to where Nick Cage was going to be Superman. I think Kevin Smith was involved for a time. It's kind of over the last five or 10 years, a lot has come out about what they had planned, but it had been all very secretive and yeah. you hadn't seen pictures up until very recently. And now it's all very widely available. I implore you to go check out that kind of stuff if you're into this. Yeah. So with all of that, the unchained, storyline wrapping everything up with this adding another they're like we're not going to go back to this our bad <laughs> Warner Brothers <laughs> says what else can we do so the options that they're interested in they said well this Batman Beyond thing was popping let's do a live action version of that or really let's go back to the origins Batman year one which is kind of what this 2022 one is doing so they had that idea after Batman and Robin, Schumacher says, I owe it to them to go gritty. This is what I wanted to do. So he's saying, put me back on the year one idea. Yeah. And I'll do that. Concurrently, two other random people, Stephen Wise and Lee Shapiro, have been pitching this idea called Batman Dark Knight, inspired by the Dark Knight Returns, Bruce, which seems everybody wants to do <laughs> that Frank Miller uh -huh. one, where he's old. Bruce Wayne has given up his career. Dick Grayson is in college. The villain you know, similarly enough, is Dr. Mm -hmm. Jonathan Crane Scarecrow. It's a darker tone. Scarecrow literally scarred 
stitched face from an accident, not a paper sack or you mm-hmm. know potato sack or whatever. Mm-hmm. But they're pitching it wrongly as a continuation with Clooney, and this can bring things along. And so Warner Brothers is like, we're going to go with the live action Batman Beyond Actually, no thanks to either of you. And they hire the writers from the animated shows and they abandon it after one draft. No. They're just like this. Well, the director as well was like, this doesn't really Uh, go for me. So then I'm uh, I'm surprised to learn that they're they're talking about making Batman (laughs) Beyond that fast. 2000. Yeah. The same year. Yeah. 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 Because I'm because uh, I feel like everybody has been waiting on it. <laughs> <laughs> well, because Warner Brothers at this point is not in the word reboot doesn't even come out until after Christopher Nolan oh, yeah. is successful. They're just like, oh, what yeah. what is different? What is different from Batman and Robin? What can we do different? Yeah. So Batman Beyond is very different and it's popular. Yes. So also concurrently with all of these ideas, there's another guy, Tim McCandless, who wrote The Iron Giant, which then mm-hmm. comes out. He pitches a TV show on the teenage years of Bruce Wayne. Oh, interesting. Okay. Warner Brothers Television loves it, but they're looking at what else is going on. And Warner Brothers, at this very moment, is seeing great success with The Matrix. It's its own, you know, right. sequel. Yep. For, you know, they're like, we're not really interested in TV for Batman at this moment. They don't want to compete. So the right. concept gets shifted around, and somebody says, well, instead of Batman, what about Superman? What about we do Superman in the so that it's the same concept, no tights, no flights. Like you're not gonna in if in the Batman version, he wouldn't have worn the costume the whole show. This becomes the that year, t- 2001, Smallville, which wow. lasts for 10 seasons until 2011 oh and really cements Warner Brothers WB network yeah. with these superhero. But that was originally a Batman idea. Wow. I had no idea. That's incredible. Yeah. I mean, Smallville was a huge, <laughs> huge success. People love that. Oh, show. yeah. And it's so inter- it's such an interesting premise where it's like, oh, he's not going to become the super. This is all like, before. Yeah. From a creative standpoint, like it's if you're like producing that type of thing, it's like, oh, sick. So we get to kind of be superheroes, but like it's all really cheap. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's just, yeah. We're just high school kids. It's, you know, this is this, it's great. <laughs> Yeah, but they say they're, in the, they're yeah. in the middle. They're in the middle of nowhere, yeah. rural. Yeah, it works. Bill. Maybe it works better for Superman than Batman if he has to be in exactly, Gotham. exactly. Yeah. A lot of great, a lot of good decisions led to led to that. <laughs> so track with me. They've axed the Batman Begins stuff. They've axed the Bruce Wayne TV show. They've a- axed the Dark Knight Scarecrow version. They've axed right. Unchained, the I Am Legend guys one. So the only thing they have left is the Year One idea. Mm-hmm. The one that Schumacher said, I want to do it. They're like, no, you're not. They hire yep. Darren Aronofsky. No way. Yeah. Oh, wow. Which I don't know if you can. So blend. Darren so Aronofsky he's... is like big out of the art art cinema crowd. He um, most famously like Requiem for a Dream. <laughs> right. uh, also Black Swan, The Wrestler. Um, yeah. So I guess Requiem is out. Yeah, um, God, I don't know what you're talking about here, Nowski. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but uh, he's hired on. They give Schumacher the boot, and he's co-writing with Frank Miller, who's the guy. He's year one. He's the Dark Knight Good Returns, Lord. and they're going ham. We're just going to go off on our own thing. Like we're going to do what we want to do with this, but still pulling some ideas. But we're not. We don't have to be true to any particular right, comic. Right. Reminds me a lot of Batman Begins. They're like, Batman rejects his inheritance. He's like, I'm not going to be some big, rich guy. He lives on the streets Mm -hmm. to prove himself. He travels the world to study martial arts. And this would be the start, again, of the Gordon, Commissioner Gordon police relationship. It goes pretty far in terms of getting things together. His cinematographer that he usually uses is on. He approaches Joaquin Phoenix to play Batman, Bruce Wayne. And they're thinking this will be R-rated. Warner Brothers wants Freddie Prince Jr. And so what? Aronofsky's like, uh oh, we're making very different movies. You're trying uh, to do the same thing again. <laughs> this is not uh, huh. at all. You want Happy Meal toys still. I, yeah, that's bizarre. Okay. Yeah. So he says, no thanks. <laughs> like, we're, this isn't going to work. Frank Miller goes on to do Sin City. And then, you know, his 300 gets made based on what he wrote. Like, he's, he's, Big and like you said, Aronofsky continues. Oh yeah, I mean he. So in 2000 is when Requiem for a Dream comes out. It he he 
muddles around with this for quite some time, but eventually the fountain comes out in 2006, which doesn't yeah. do quite well for him. But then he pops off with the wrestler and black swan, both in yeah. 2008 and 2010. And so from then on out, he's been making quite a few things. Uh, Noah mother was one of the yeah. more recent ones that are doing quite well. And then he does have one that looks like it could be out this year called the whale is in post production. Oh. Yeah. He, so he and Frank Miller don't, it doesn't, this doesn't kill them. Warner brothers, we don't, we're not going to do the year one thing now. We're going to make a movie called Batman versus Superman. And you're like, wait, isn't this 14 years too early? Whoa. And the Whoa. answer is yes. So the, the, there's a, a new Warner studio head in 99. And he's like, we're going to make Batman and Superman films. And that's what we're going to do. And of course, as I'm saying, they're trying to do both of those things and failing at both of them. They had this different Superman in the works. But then they get pitched this Batman versus Superman idea. And funny that you had mentioned that this uh, this most recent one is kind of like a seven mystery. Yeah, story. this one, if I had to give some quick comparables, like just on an aesthetic level, the biggest like references for it are like Blade Runner <laughs> and all of uh, David Fincher's films in particular seven. But yeah. That those are the those are the two big influence visually here. <laughs> so this this Batman versus Superman was written and pitched by Andrew Kevin Walker, who wrote Seven. Good lord, he has this idea. Kind of, I mean, people. Are, it seems like they're always circling around this Dark Knight Returns comic because this is five years after Batman's retirement. Alfred mm. Robin, Commissioner Gordon are all dead. Mm. Clark Kent and Bruce Wayne are old friends. Batman's fiance is killed. Superman is blamed. It's all Lex oh. Luthor. It's, it involves everyone. <laughs> Filming was planned in 2003, was going to release in 2004, but then there was a new Superman solo film that Warner Brothers was interested in because it was more optimistic. Right. And so 11 to 1 executive vote, they said, we're not going to do the team up. We're going to go back to separate films. Wow. But David Goyer, who wrote the newer ones, said like this idea, it's kind of like where you go when you've exhausted all possibilities. Right. You're, you're just right. throwing the kitchen sink in. So yeah. after all of this, after Batman and Robin, they're like, we've got no Batman and it's 2004. We got to make something. So they quickly make Catwoman, <laughs> the idea that had been pitched oh, right. in 95 yes. and then yeah. been in development hell and shifted around. Halle Berry goes on because she was supposed to have a Die Another Day spinoff. Right. And that got canceled. Catwoman is, you know, critically repulsive Hand. to people, <laughs> lost $20 million. Yeah. Really depressing thing, though. It is the highest grossing female-led superhero film until Wonder Woman, which comes out 13 years later. Oh, my gosh. Really? Well, That's, they didn't make any. <laughs> like, they didn't make many. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I don't think a lot of people turned out for Elektra. Uh, right, right. Led by Jennifer Gardner. I did, uh, yeah. but nobody else did. <laughs> yeah. So- that's what they're working with. After all that hustle and bustle and all that mess of trying to get anything, they end up with Catwoman in 2004. Totally forgot about that. So here comes now the, the seven years of the reboot stuff. Nolan getting involved starting in 2003. And I hadn't seen much about, it was just kind of like, oh, he got on. But it was like, how and why? Right. It seemed a strange choice. But again, thinking of it as like, they're not even thinking of reboots. They're just like, what does anybody have a different idea? Yeah. And then we're going to double back on you and say, we want Happy Meal toys. <laughs> like, but I think they're on their last leg. So Nolan's agent said, well, this is dying. It's who knows what, but what, what would you do with Batman? Because Warner Brothers right. is asking around. Nolan had been big into Dick Donner's 78 Superman. And he's like, well, they never did that sort of Batman, the origin, how he became on screen and the world he lives in is the world we live in. Like, it's not like Tim Burton's art piece. Right, right, it's, right. It's the Superman lived in Metropolis, which was New York City. You know, it's like how. So he's just like, that's that's all I said. You know, that's what I said. That's what I would do. And also Superman had a great ensemble cast, wasn't a bunch of randos. So that's what I want, too. Right. Very much inspired by The Man Who Falls, which was a comic that came out in 89. Some of the imagery mm -hmm. will be apparent. Young Bruce falls mm -hmm. down a well. Bats swarm him. He travels the world as a teenager, <laughs> learns in a monastery, trains with Ducard. All of that. <laughs> Wait a sec. Fits perfectly. <laughs> so eventually this gets made in 2005. His style 
traditional stunts, little CGI, a choice though. He's like, I don't, nothing gory or bloody because he's like, I, mm-hmm. this is what I wanted to see when I was 10 to 12. So I'm not going to make it that right. dark. Of course, Dark Knight changes some of that probably. A bit. But, yeah. You know. <laughs> but interesting that it's like you're saying this newer one, you know, the, the Christopher Again, Nolan you know, pales. It's funny he's here because you just said he's like he lives in our world, and then you watch you watch the new one and you compare <laughs> it to the ones that Christopher Nolan made, and you yeah. go, Mm-mm, he does not. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. That's interesting. Um, yeah, uh, it, it, but if you know, up at, at that time, so it much more certainly looked more like our world than like the Burton or the Schumacher yeah, films. Definitely. Oh my god! <laughs> so you know, when he says that, you definitely see it. I'm not saying that he that he resembles nothing of reality in it. That's not at all what I mean. But yeah, <laughs> when truly, you look at the new yeah. one, they really go to lengths to be like, okay, how would this really play out? <laughs> yeah, and truly nothing that anybody had seen before, not in the animated versions, right, and not right. in the live action. So he had not planned it to be a trilogy. He was like, I just want to see if it's successful at all. Mm-hmm. We're not gonna do the whole thing of what the Matrix had and, and all that. So don't think about. You might it. not get a second yeah. one. You <laughs> yeah. might, and you yeah. certainly might not get a third one. So why don't you just make one good one now? And that was his plan. <laughs> so. 2007, the Justice League film, which we had mentioned in our Justice League episode, was happening with George Miller, who did Mad Max, Army Hammer, was going to be a younger Batman. Right. Like they're, they're all over the place. They were also uh. working on that, which is a revitalization with a younger Batman, all of the Justice League. But then, as we had said, it got pushed back for the writer's strike, and then there was a tax How rebate How much like, weird backstabbing <laughs> and like clickiness there is in the warner executive God. offices you know like because it sounds like everybody is lying to everyone <laughs> no no i'd love to make that with you and they turn around i'm never making that with it. <laughs> yeah <laughs> nolan does the prestige in between which it boggles the mind and they're like so can you do the second one come up with a second right. one so he right. gets his brother jonathan to help him co-write and it comes out in 2008 don't need to say too much about it biggest domestic box office ever up to that time 158 million in the first weekend i remember how hard it was to go to the theater oh really it all i i it's Booked. one of it's one of the rare times when i felt like i just I, wow i'm just not going to be able to see it this weekend um, and that just <laughs> does not happen too too much um and this was I, I felt like it for this movie in 2008 that lasted for like two weeks it was really really hard to get Screen. Yeah, yeah, did way better than eighty nine. It, it, it two point yeah. five times. Better. They did it. <laughs> yeah. They 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 were chasing that high, and baby, they surpassed it. So then, Nolan's like, I don't find doing another one necessary. <laughs> you know, like all third right. m- most third movies are horrible, or they're just what is the point? So right, he commits to Inception. In the meantime, David Goyer and his brother Jonathan are working on the screenplay. Goyer is also writing the Superman reboot. Right. Eventually, Dark Knight Rises comes out in 2012, leaves us satisfied, didn't do as well as Dark Knight, but got us to a a satisfying conclusion for where he was and what it was all about. So the fallout of this, this makes the term reboot a word now in every studio's mind. (laughs) Right. But the thing that I don't think people realize is like, like I said, he had three years in between one and two and four years in between two and three, and he made two other films in between. And he was like, that's that's the best way to go about doing this because the audience has time to sit with it. Yeah. And it you're able to make something of value connected piece to piece. So you ever have that thing like you're working on, you're like trying to beat a video game and you, and you just can't, mm, you just can't <laughs> do it. You just over and over again, yeah. you can't do it. And then you're like, okay, I got to get up and walk away. Yeah. And you walk away for however long it could be short, a long time you come back and then you nail it. You just yeah. nail it. You're in the flow. Yeah. The idea is that you can, uh, with these stories, is you you do have so much energy in the tank for each one of these. So when you're going off and you're making The Dark Knight and you're not sure if there's going to be another one or not, the best thing you can do to get creatively refreshed is to go off and make a very different story. Get creatively refreshed in all sorts of different directions. Get challenged in totally different ways. Yeah. So then when it comes back, you've had time to process. The audience has had time to process. And, you know, you oh, now I can return to this material and look at it from a different point of view and actually give it something to say instead of rolling right into it <laughs> and not understanding what the point of this one is. 
Uh, yeah. <laughs> that's, so that's, what's, that's kind of the mistake. So again, just back to the, the energy there is like, okay, so walk away and come back and you might actually be set up for success much faster that way. And this seven year time span, it's almost like DC and Warner Brothers are left now holding nothing in a way because it's like you got what you wanted from a really good creative voice and he's out and <laughs> like it didn't yeah it, what, and what it's did you, over what because did you a want? good story yeah. <laughs> ends you know so it is over and all the while you have the first run of the marvel movies Dude, coming iron out. man to avengers yeah <laughs> well yeah no yeah no, so it, all so I'll back it up though from 2000 to 2008 how many of those movies come out uh it's the first draft of the mcu which right, now they're right. like wrapping back into itself so okay so and then they get the bright idea in around 2006, 2007, to maybe we, this can start working in a different chronology. Maybe there's a more of a canon here in a different way that these are connected in ways we hadn't thought about. Yeah. Meanwhile, Warner Brothers is sitting there focusing on Batman because they can't conceive of how another one of these things would really go. Because again, this is the time we're not in the middle of the superhero, you know, gold rush that we're in now. These things were a lot harder to convince people it was going to work. Yeah. And the CGI proposition, but you have Nolan who's like, I don't care about CGI. So it works right. for what's available at the time, especially. Yeah. But with them being so focused on these that they then when the story has wrapped itself up, they're left with really nothing. <laughs> Nothing that connects, that nothing, no story to continue here. People don't really want Joseph Gordon Levitt to be Batman or Robin or any, you know, like it's that's not, not designed what, that that's way. not yeah. not designed for that exactly. So it's interesting then as the Dark Knight Rises wraps up in 2012, like you said, from 2008 to 2012, 2012 Avengers <laughs> is out, baby. The 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 game they got is them all here. Together. Yeah. So that's what my <laughs> brother know, it says. Happened. Yeah, my brother says where it's like forever then DC is playing catch up of being like, well, we're just going to put them all together because it's like, no, but they spent, they spent six a, years uh, getting mm-hmm. <laughs> getting the gang together. And- Look at it this way. They did one draft of the universe and then they went, hold on, whoa, whoa, whoa. Let's start over. Yeah. <laughs> and then they, they started over the, the entire universe. Mm-hmm. They have time here to work on all these other movies to get together, but they're in the middle of making dark Knight when iron man comes out. They re- and the thing too is DC has been flip flopping for themselves and their audience, which is one of the blessings and curses of Batman. As we learned in our first episode of like, he can be a lot of different things, tonally, stylistically, thematically, whereas Marvel has cemented, the tone of what they want their movies to be. And so like, are we going to compete with them or are we going to do our own thing? And they're still struggling to decide whether they're going to. Honestly, I don't think they should compete. (laughs) I think it's a mistake to compete with them. I think they should look at what they have on their hands right now and consider that maybe there's more root for success here if they lean into like artists. Because I think the way to go about this is to give people the iterations of these characters that they actually do want instead of trying to put all eggs in one basket the biggest budget imaginable to get the biggest audience imaginable now we've realized with streaming and all these things we can break these stories out they can be a little bit smaller in scope and be really specific yeah so when you look at what they have on their hands now is they did the joker a few years ago which wildly enough had this incredible (laughs) oscar run Yeah, yeah now they have the batman Looking at it on this end, it looks like a good answer to the Joker. Not saying that they're connected, that they are the same world at all. But they are very, very stark, independent swaths of what an artist thinks that this could be. Mm -hmm. And that on itself is really, really worth looking at. Yeah, And so I I wonder if maybe there's more route for them to be successful here with getting specific with these stories. Now we can do Batman. I don't I almost don't know why this wasn't just Batman Beyond, you know, like, you know, <laughs> well, so you know like seriously. Yeah. <laughs> here's kind of the we'll, we'll breeze through 2013 onwards what they tried to do with that. Like you're saying it's a lot of executives in a million different directions. So 
Marvel like laid out their rubric for what considered what yeah. is a Marvel film, and you can't go outside those lines. And a lot of filmmakers find that to be really constricting. Yeah. A lot of fi- filmmakers find perfectly, you know, enabling constraints within that, you know, and that's just what it is. But I think that you can't win at their game. I'm yeah. saying you, you, if you lean into letting just people go off on their own road and they come back with something that looks nothing like anybody else's, that's way better than just trying to emulate <laughs> the Avengers. Yeah. So what. DC, what they're working with now in 2013, they're discussing a follow-up to Man of Steel with Zack Mm -hmm. Snyder. And so they're like, oh, maybe we'll do his style. So then they go back to the Batman versus Superman idea, which the date gets moved twice because Marvel Civil War now is coming out, which is their second team up movie. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And so, you know, he's like, we're bringing Batman into the universe that Superman lives in. This got badly reviewed. On to Justice League, which we covered at length, 2017, Zack Snyder left. They replaced with Joss Whedon from Marvel. Fascinating. You could see how it's all interwoven. The only shred of thought of like, oh, let the creator do their version, which I loved this, is 2017's The Lego Batman Movie. Oh, my God. Very, very good. It's the same people that did the Lego movie, so it's got that same style and comedy and everything. But I totally overlooked it. They didn't even think it's beautiful. That. Watch it. They, they lean into everything. So it's as if all previous films have happened and mentioned That's it's funny. full in continuity to everything. And the idea is putting the Burt Ward Robin from the 66 in the Batmobile with the Frank Miller Batman. So it's like the grumpiest, moodiest, broodiest Batman with the most oh. positive, <laughs> you know, cartoony kid. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and comedy. <laughs> it's wonderful. Yeah. So I think that that's like, who knows how that got through, <laughs> but that ended up. I love it. Yeah. I'll the, have to go check it out now. Right, right before Joker, you know, the, the TV show offshoots, uh-huh. there's a ton of animated stuff, but Gotham. That, oh, Gotham, <laughs> the show. That, that was the young God. Bruce Wayne idea coming back. Right. There we go. If, they yeah, did it. It focuses, <laughs> it focuses more on Commissioner Gordon, but it's still there. And that was. 2014 to 2019 Mm -hmm. and then in 2019 alone batwoman tv show pennyworth which is the prequel about alfred and an animated harley quinn show have all come out so they i think yeah the harley quinn stuff uh, you know that exploded with both suicide squads now she has her own movie yeah it's (laughs) yeah it's all over the place so recently yeah the the interesting thing about the most recent one you saw where it's like oh they finally let somebody do their own thing was not the plan at all In 2017, Matt Reeves was hired to replace. So Ben Affleck, they were like, we're going with his Batman. He's going to direct, produce, co-write, and star in the next Batman. This was Ben Affleck's Batman movie. (laughs) And and that is wild to think that that's what this this started as. Yeah. (laughs) And then he was like, well, actually, I'm not going to direct. And then he's like, actually, I'm going to not do any of it. It becomes a reboot plan for a trilogy with this with Matt Reeves, but he's like, I'm working on Planet of the Apes, so I need to work on that until that's done. And then in 2020, the DC Films president was like, there's going to be two Batmans existing via a multiverse. So you got this one and then you got Affleck's one. But then they also announced in The Flash that Michael Keaton is going to come back and they're going to disregard the Schumacher films entirely. Uh, And I think (laughs) that's... That's it's like, are we still in a state of all over the place? Bring up the multiverse because we will confess (laughs) as creatives that we have run out of story. (laughs) And this is the only way to move these for these characters forward. I don't know. That was my feeling walking (laughs) away from No Way Home yesterday. Yeah, there, you know, I I will also mention because it's going to infuriate more, but there's. There was supposed to be a spinoff series about the police department based on Reeves' thing. There is going to be another show focusing on the Penguin. And then right, instead, of the, that this week. instead of the police department one, it's going to focus on Arkham. Interesting. There's also a Batgirl standalone film that's going to be on HBO Max. So like there's still – it seems well, like they haven't changed from after 1997. Yeah. My God. Who is <laughs> – stop. Stop. Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah. And I think, yeah, like, the, the, the central conflict that I find is they've always had the darker stuff. Listen to our first part about Detective Comics. Yeah. But that doesn't appeal as much to a larger audience or make as much money right. as Marvel stuff does. And so they want both. They want to compete. This is all for my brother, by the way. I don't, I don't follow it as much as he does. But it's like 
Sure. The villains also are more interesting. It's why DC even has a Suicide Squad and Marvel doesn't, because their villains, the darker side of the stories, have always been more interesting for most people. Yeah. It's a puzzle that we have not solved and will and may not. You know, this this new film is a different version. Yeah. And at least you're like you're saying is putting out elements of the character and the thematics well, that, that have not been addressed. Yes, it really is going hard to try to show you something a version a, a, a situation to this character unlike you have seen before i mean and i get it, it really attacks the everybody the major criticism i ever heard of all these movies is like well, he's not a detective he's a terrible detective <laughs> yeah <laughs> and i'm like okay well if that's the criticism then everyone should just love this <laughs> right <laughs> this this is batman and gordon in seven trying to Be solve a detective it. yeah I don't know. I I don't I don't understand why you could put out a movie like this that's like putting him in a squirrel costume that's you know because it's real and that's how it would work and he botches the landing mm. because he's never done it and then I wake up the next day and I see the perfect toy snap wings <laughs> with a bat wing visage that is not present in the film. This is the problem and I don't understand who's responsible for this because I I mean I get you want to sell your toys, but coming from the kid back in 1997 <laughs> that you just pissed off because you wouldn't just produce the toy from the movie, you're still doing it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's pretty wild. Well, you know, Evan, it's all about the money. That's... Uh, I didn't buy it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. I'm just... I, I'm, uh, I don't know. It's so wild and frustrating. <laughs> well, welcome to the Batman fandom, I guess. Yeah, yeah. really. <laughs> Oh my gosh, what a what a story. This has been a blast to, to expand this out over two parts and really get into the roots of where this property has been because it's been all over the place. <laughs> and maybe oh. we'll continue to, yeah. And is that a good thing? You know, let us know. Reach out at IlliteratePod on Instagram. Do you like that they're doing so many different takes to Batman right is that part of it it will it always be a conflict of what is he let's find out next month right in the next it's a, it, and it's interesting too because now with all these different people playing all these different versions of the same character all simultaneously are we gonna get sequels to all of these different movies <laughs> <laughs> but we'll see what they end up doing with it who knows I heard the flash has even pushed back an entire year yeah, to yeah, 2023 yeah. so we'll see all right, guys. Thank you so much for listening to us. Uh, do us a favor. Rate us wherever you listen into this. Give us a rating. It really helps us out more than you know. And take a look through our episodes. If there's a title that makes you think of somebody, maybe send it to them. We need to spread this word of mouth. That's how it grows. If you like what we do here, if you want to keep this coming at you every week, get in touch with us, share it, like us, rate us, and we will catch you next